Welcome to Candid Conversation. As you can see, there has been a time change here, so we got sun now in the morning instead of the darkness that we've been used to. The topic today is Luke 7:28. Luke 7:28. Jesus said, "Among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist." But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And I wanted to mention this, explain what it means, because it also helps us uh, with those who argue against us saying that we follow Paul and that we're worshiping Paul, not Jesus. Uh, you notice Jesus is the one who says this in Luke 7, 28, regarding John the Baptist. The first thing to note is he says, among those that are born of women. What he means by that is that among those who, in other words, in the flesh, if we are to look at fleshly considerations of, of somebody, um, and that's why he ends the verse by saying, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So what it does, it establishes the, the fact that regardless of how great you are, physically speaking, and the reason John the Baptist is, there is none greater born of women. There isn't, is not uh, the, the, the verse in Matthew, the parallel verse in Matthew says there's not one greater than John the Baptist. Uh, the one in Luke, and this is why I brought the Luke one up, is it adds that word prophet. There is not a greater prophet. So you can see what he's talking about there. The What, what it means is that, you know, in other words, John the Baptist had, among those born of women, <laughs> he had the best uh, scenario because he was to prepare the way for the Messiah. He was born, I mean, he's not, he wasn't, um, in other words, it's not nothing he did. It was that he was born of Elizabeth and Zacharias, and uh, he was of the Holy Ghost. That born of you is of the Holy Ghost because Zacharias and Elizabeth were not able to have kids at the time. They were too old. So, they... Um, the fact that he was even born, it was a miraculous birth. And then we're told that God raised him up in the wilderness. And uh, basically it sounds like God the Father is the one who raised him and taught him the things of God. And so he understood then when his showing, when a time of his showing to Israel came, he, he right away says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, how did he know to teach that? You know, if it's uh, if it's a uh, if it's a new message, you know, no one before him did that, taught that. It was because he was given the distinct ministry to prepare the way for the Lord. That's why he's a greater prophet. Elijah called down fire from heaven. Uh, Elisha did sixteen recorded miracles in your Bible. There are some great prophets in your Old Testament, but the reason that Jesus says John the Baptist is a greater prophet is because of the message that he brought. He was getting his call. Most of those prophets were usually calling about God's punishment of Israel. Israel would go through five cycles of chastisement uh, before they're brought into the kingdom of God. And they're, so there, a lot of times those prophets were saying, repent, turn back to God, or else you're gonna go into captivity. God's gonna punish you. And the message of John the Baptist wasn't of punishment. Well, I mean, he said it. He said that, you know, those, they're gonna be purged with fire. So, I mean, he mentioned that, but the main, Re, the main thrust of his message was the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he had the greatest message. That's why it makes him a greater, the greater prophet. It's not that he was any better than Elijah or Elisha or Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or any of those guys. It was just that he 
gave the message of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, uh, be water baptized. Repent, believe the gospel, be water baptized. And you will have eternal life in that kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. And so that made him a greater prophet in the message that he gave. But then, from a spiritual consideration, now, of course, I believe John the Baptist is a safe individual. He's going to be in uh, the kingdom of heaven uh, on earth, it, uh, God's eternal kingdom on earth uh, in Israel's program. He's probably going to have a high position of authority, you would think. He wasn't one of the 12 apostles. He's not going to sit on one of the 12 thrones. But you would think he would have a, a high position in that kingdom. So, um, but he says there, he, so there was not a greater prophet among those that are born of women. There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What it shows is that when it comes to God's eternal kingdom, our consideration shouldn't be fleshly. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we know no man after the flesh. Uh, once the love of Christ constrains us, that we know no man after the flesh. To, we should thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So if we're looking at fleshly considerations, Jesus says, you can say that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet because of the message that he gave. But still, without believing the gospel, John the Baptist is still dead in his trespasses and sins. He's still going to hell, even though uh, he was the greatest prophet. But if he believed the gospel of the kingdom, of course, he's got eternal life in God's kingdom on earth, and I believe he does. But, um, but you see there that he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So John the Baptist was born with the best advantages, spiritually speaking, as a prophet because he was preaching salvation, gospel of the kingdom for Israel. And so that made him the greatest prophet due, due to his message. But that doesn't matter. We're not looking at fleshly considerations. We're looking at spiritual considerations. And so if all you did was look at the flesh, and John the Baptist never believed the gospel, which I believe he did, but let's just say he didn't, then he's going to hell. But then you got somebody who had the worst fleshly situation ever, um, you know, whoever it was, maybe somebody who was born blind, maybe someone who couldn't walk, uh, maybe someone who had mental problems, maybe someone who had, you know, the man who had 2,000 devils in him. You had all these different, you know, there was a child in Matthew, 17 I think it may be Matthew 19 that uh, was possessed of a devil I mean it's not the fault of the child that they're possessed of a devil it's probably the you know the upbringing we talked Sunday about how there are mothers who end up doing you know taking drugs or doing things that cause birth defects in their kids there's a, autism is a big thing and I think I've heard it due to vaccinations that are done. I don't know why the people end up being autistic, but you have people who are just born with decreased mental capacities or birth defects, and it's absolutely no fault of their own. And so you may think, well, that's unfair because they didn't get to enjoy life or people don't live as long of a life. You may say it's unfair that my wife only got to live 53 years, whereas my grandmother lived 106. She lived twice as long. And then there are other people who die you know, at 26, half of what Lana lived. There are people who die at 13, half of that. You know, um, and you may say, well, that's unfair. All those things, all they are are fleshly circumstances. When you get to eternity, that stuff won't matter. If you suffer in pain with back problems, or you have uh, cancer, or you have fibromyalgia, or you, you know, whatever you have, whatever health problems you have, or you, you know, you die in a car accident when you're three years old due to a drunk driver. It, you know, you got all these fleshly considerations and you can say that's not fair. Well, it doesn't matter in eternity.
because in eternity your back problems aren't there. You don't have the fibromyalgia. You don't have the cancer. Uh, the person killed by a drunk driver, they've got all their, you know, forever they're going to live. So, uh, and there won't be any ailments in heaven. So you don't have to worry about that stuff. And, and so that's, that's Jesus' point, is that even though John the Baptist had the greatest circumstances among, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But that doesn't matter. You shouldn't say, oh, well, that's not fair that John the Baptist got to be that great prophet and I don't get to. Well, it says, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The person who just barely makes it, who curses God their entire lives and say they're atheist, and then on their deathbed, they believe the gospel and they're saved. And so then they get to, for today anyway, they get to go to heaven. Those people like that will be least in the kingdom of God, that deathbed repentance, but yet they're in a better position than physically speaking, anyway, John the Baptist was. Because being that great prophet, John the Baptist, once he dies, he was beheaded at, a, at an early age, 30, I don't know, and that's probably why he wasn't one of the 12 apostles, because uh, God knew that he would be killed. So he's killed at, what, 33 or, or less, uh, beheaded. Um, so, so it doesn't, but the point is, he's only that great prophet for, what, three years, maybe? Probably not even that long. In fact, I think you could probably say he was more like six months or nine months, probably, because he started about six months before Jesus did and he was beheaded it seems like shortly after uh, he started his ministry so um, you know it sounds like he wasn't uh, didn't get to you know get to be a prophet for that long but in eternity the person who has the deathbed repentance they're going to be in the kingdom of god forever they're least in the kingdom because they didn't have a position. They didn't allow Christ to live in them because all they did was believe the gospel just before they died. But, so they're least in the kingdom of God, but they're going to be in that position in the kingdom of God for all eternity. And the, the least favorable position in the kingdom of God is far better than the greatest position in God's program on earth so it's a better position because he don't have to deal with the curse of sin the god of this world the reason john the baptist was killed so early is because he called out king herod i mean he his job was to prepare the way for the lord which meant to get the nation of israel to believe their messiah repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and so that included going to those high political leaders and getting them, because they're the ones that control the nation, the political and religious leaders, and getting them to change their minds, stop trusting in their religion and their positions, and believe in uh, trusting God to save them, and there is imputed righteousness, and be water baptized. And so he went to King Herod and told him it wasn't right for him to, you know, what he did, the, uh, the adultery that he did, and um, he ends up being killed, you know. So, he's the greatest prophet born of women, and he doesn't get to prophesy for probably more than a year, probably not that long at all. But in eternity, the person who is least in the kingdom of God is going to be there for all eternity, and there's no adversity. So it's a far better place. No more tears, death, sorrow, crying. All the things due to sin are gone because there is no sin in the kingdom. So. Um, his point is, uh, Jesus' point here in, what's the scripture, Luke 7, 28, is to show Israel that it doesn't matter your physical circumstances or mental circumstances or how long you live or how much Bible you know in terms of getting into the kingdom, how rich you are. What matters is... Are you going to be in God's kingdom, eternal kingdom? Because all these fleshly circumstances will just fade away 
in God's kingdom. You won't be dealing with that stuff. So he's saying, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest prophet that ever lived, John the Baptist. And of course, the consideration is, he's not trying to say John the Baptist isn't that great. He says, among those that are born of women, if we're, which means a fleshly consideration. Now, John, I believe, believed the gospel of the kingdom that he preached. And so he was also born of the spirit. So he will be in God's kingdom. But what he's saying is, if all we're going to do is make the fleshly considerations, the best situation, spiritually speaking, for someone in the flesh is less than the worst situation, spiritually speaking, for someone in the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God doesn't have the curse of sin. It doesn't have all the... Um, the you know results negative consequences of the sin and uh, it's gonna last forever there isn't the adversity of sin that you have to deal with and so th that's what he's saying here now the reason I wanted to cover this is because what that tells us then is that's our attitude toward Paul as well if we're when we're right dividers and tell people you've got to read Paul's epistles to get the sound doctrine for today People say, oh, you're worshiping Paul. You should be worshiping Jesus, not worshiping Paul. Paul was just a man. Jesus was God. So we need your, your worshiping man. You've created an idol out of Paul. And that's not the case. You never hear anybody saying that about John the Baptist. They were disciples of John. No one ever says, oh, well, John the Baptist was, an, they created an idol out of John the Baptist by being a disciple of John. No, what it is, is he was just the greater prophet. He was just in that position. And so he was the best one to listen to at the time, preparing the way for the Messiah. It's why Peter, James, and John, they were following John the Baptist. But then when Jesus came, they followed Jesus. And John even told them. He says, uh, I must decrease, he must increase. There's one coming after me. Uh, I'm not even worthy to unlatch his shoe. And that has to do with the kinsman redeemer. If you're going to be a kinsman redeemer, you have to take that shoe off. He says, now, as part of the ceremony, you can read that in Ruth with Boaz, what he does. John says, I'm not even worthy to be part of the kinsman redeemer process. Uh, you know, but yet there were people who were disciples of him. So he was not magnifying himself. He was magnifying what he was doing as that great prophet. And it's the same thing when it comes to Paul. We're not magnifying Paul. Romans 16, 25, we're, well, we're told in Ephesians 3 that the mystery was given to Paul. 2 Corinthians 9 tells us, a dispensation of the gospel has been committed unto me, is what Paul says. So it's not that they were worshiping Paul. He just happens to be the due time testifier. He's the one that was given the instructions for today. Just like the people who were disciples of John, they're not worshiping John. John just happened to be the one who was preparing the way for the Messiah. And he was pointing people to Jesus. So they listened to what John said and believed it because that was of God. The message was of God, but they weren't following John the Baptist, the man. They were following him because of his message. And that's the same thing when it comes to Paul. Paul says in Romans 11, 13, that he is the apostle of the Gentiles. And then he says that he magnifies his office. He doesn't say he magnifies himself. He says the only thing he glories in is the cross of Christ. You're not going to glory in his position. He doesn't magnify himself. He magnifies his office. And the reason we follow Paul's epistles, we're not following Paul. But the dispensation of the gospel for today was given to Paul. Ephesians 3 says the mystery, that doctrine for today, was committed unto Paul. And, and he says in Romans 16, 25, that he has given the preaching of the mystery. It, it is the revel, I'm sorry, it's the revelation of the mystery. And it is the gospel according to the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says in Galatians 1, the gospel that I preach wasn't taught to me by man, and I didn't receive it of man but by revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul isn't exalting himself, and we're not worshiping Paul when we follow Paul's epistles. It's just that the 
message for today was given to Paul. You might say, among those that are born of women, there is no greater prophet than Paul for us today. Prophet meaning he's speaking the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord was given to him. All the instructions for us today are found exclusively in Paul's epistles. And so we're not following Paul, but we're following Jesus Christ through Paul. Paul preached the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man be a spiritual or a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So yeah, Paul wrote them down. But Paul wrote them down as instructed by the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ to us today. And they're the only commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ to us today found in the Bible. And so we're not exalting Paul, but we're exalting Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 says that Jesus Christ is the Word. The words of Jesus Christ in Romans through Philemon are not any less than the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But in fact, we need to magnify the words of Jesus Christ in Paul's epistles because they are the words written to us today. We're still going to read the red letters and we're still going to learn from them. But there is the greater emphasis upon Paul's epistles because they're written to us today. Those who claim that we make an idol out of Paul they're not reading the book of Leviticus and trying to follow that because they recognize it's not written to them today. So too, we don't follow the red letters because the words of Jesus Christ to us today are in Paul's epistles. And that doesn't make Paul a God to us. We're not worshiping Paul. It's just we recognize that those are the words of Jesus Christ to us today. So among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet today than Paul, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And Paul realized that. So we're just following Jesus Christ's words to us today when we follow Paul's epistles. Thanks for watching.